Yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, <clears throat> How to Buy a Gorilla came, came about because uh, about seven years ago, it must have been 2010, um, I was having a chat with uh, Debbie Morrison at Isbar, and she said, the new business circuit in London is still asking, um, saying, I want to buy a gorilla. So find me an agency where I can buy a gorilla. Uh, in fairness to uh, another very well-known agency, they were also saying I'd like to buy a meerkat, but that didn't make for such a good title for a book. Um, <clears throat> but at any rate, uh, at any rate the, the, my, my immediate response was, you have to have a, a, a marketing organisation that's capable of buying a gorilla, capable of developing a gorilla. And gorilla became a, um, a, a shorthand, whoops, there we go, a shorthand for... Um, a different kind of ad. So what is a gorilla? Um, a, a gorilla is an ad that breaks rules. Um, it's unconventional. It's, gen it's genuinely creative. It's much more powerful. It's much more effective. Um, they don't comply to the formulaic uh, conventions of a 30-second TV commercial. Um, they can be in any medium. It can be a brand idea. But it's something that stops consumers in their tracks. It's something that gives... Uh, viewers goosebumps when they see it um, and they're genuinely difficult to develop according to system one research with their five star rating of uh, emotional engagement with ads only four percent of six and a half thousand ads in their database achieve a five star rating um, these are the ads that we want to produce they're the ads that clients want to buy but we so rarely do um, and it got me to thinking why is that um, the problem is that the environment stinks, um, as is ever the case. Um, if you consider that the two components that would make uh, a, a great ad like that are the nature, the DNA of a gorilla, so that's the product, the proposition, the insight, uh, the brief, the brand itself, we spend a, a, a huge amount of time working on this side of, uh, 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 of the equation, and very little... Um, or much less time on the nurture. And the nurture is the agency itself, the talent within that agency, how motivated they are, the process between the client and the agency, how they work together, what are their uh, developmental stages, the, the nature of the relationship, the amount of money being invested, and the amount of time allowed to produce this sort of work. Um, so How to Buy a Gorilla concentrates exclusively on the, the, the nurture. When we look more closely at that, we have this um, triangle of doom between marketing, procurement, and agencies that pretty much exists everywhere, whereby um, marketing and procurement are responsible for determining budgeting and investment. Um, procurement and agencies are um, arguing over different ways of paying and amounts of paying, and marketing and agencies have to work out ways of working and what they do together. But within this triangle that's responsible for developing um, huge amounts of return on very large investments, there are multiple symptoms of dysfunction. Um, marketing, you can see that there are climbing pitch numbers which indicate, in, indicate growing dissatisfaction. There's an increase in project-based deals. Um, I've heard from a lot of marketers that there's cynicism of, a, of an hourly-based rate because agencies are literally incentivized to, to drag their feet. Um, from the procurement perspective, uh, Isbar's last paying for advertising report found that 46% of clients were unhappy with their agency deal. I would be interested to see the agency response to that. I imagine it's significantly higher than 46%. But the, the bigger problem here is that um, procurement are incentivized to save. I did a, a, a training course with Isbar about six years ago and had 10 procurement people in the room and asked them, who was personally incentivized by a bonus to make a saving on marketing services that year, and 10 hands went up around the table. And then I asked them to keep their hands up if they're in any way accountable for the value of the marketing services they procured, and 10 hands went down. So they devolved the responsibility for that to marketing. So marketing are in a position where they can be sometimes, if, 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 they, uh, if they don't have a good working relationship with procurement, they can feel hamstrung by them. On the other hand, they can use procurement to be the bad dog that, that, that um, tries to spread their budgets further. Um, 
And in the agency world, um, as Sarah said earlier, the profitability is at an all-time low. Uh, agencies are, are drowning. They're not waving. Um, so we have a, a, a real problem here because um, what we have is um, divergent interests at best. Um, at worst, they're mutually exclusive interests. Um, that creates a low trust environment. That creates fragile relationships. And the outcome of, of all of these is, uh, is inevitable. It wasn't by chance that I made Clint East with the agencies. <laughs> so we need to figure out how we can move forward. The nature of a Mexican standoff as a, as a problem is that you can't get out of a Mexican standoff by talking about your agenda. It's impossible to say this is what I need in order for us to get out because everyone's acting in their own interest. So we have to find a, a shared interest. And that shared interest then is value. But then that begs the question of what is value? And not only that, but not just what it is, but how we create it together. So I set about thinking of how we could redefine the business problem or find a way that we can define this business problem. Because at the moment, there seems to be a, a generalist way of saying this is the way we do um, agency remuneration, this is the way we work together. And those processes and those ways of paying don't really change according to the business problem. So starting with the business problem, I said, okay, let's say there's a high capacity for growth. That doesn't mean that it's a growth market. That means it's a market which is advertising responsive. So um, it, it's, not a, it's not a straightforward question of whether or not we're in a boom time in this category. It's a question of whether or not people respond to advertising positively. Um, and then the second question is whether or not you've got a, a, a significant market share already, because these create three different conditions which have three different problems, three different roles. Um, if you have a capacity for growth and a large market share, then the job of the advertising is often to fight off new market entrants, c continue with the momentum that you've already got, engage new customers whilst continuing to reward and stimulate your own. Um, it's a high stake um, investment. It's a moderate risk because you've already got a reasonable amount of momentum. Uh, if you're in consumer goods, you've got you know, a decent distribution. So you should expect a, a, a high return from that kind of thing. And this is what I would define as a gorilla kind of problem. This is where you need a gorilla. If you don't have um, that critical mass already, if you're competing with better resourced market leaders, you have to fight a lot harder for attention. The nature of this is a, a, a lower stake because you can't afford to just buy market share in most instances. It's therefore a higher risk with a lower stake if you want a high possible return. So I've characterized this as a spider monkey because a, a spider monkey is um, much more agile, it's much quicker, it can get in, swipe away a banana from a gorilla and get out again without getting hurt. That's kind of the idea as a shorthand for the nature of the business problem that this might be. That leaves us with um, a large market share with little capacity for growth. And it might be little capacity for growth, or it might also be um, a, a deliberate wish to limit growth. I know that sounds a little bit strange, but if you are running a portfolio business and have multiple products in a single category, you don't necessarily want world-beating ads that are going to cannibalize your own business. So there is a role for more conservative work from time to time. Um, and the job there is to maintain your market share efficiently, potentially nudge it forward, um, but, but um, much more conservative expectations for it. You're going to be in a stable or declining market, or you're going to have a lower competitive threat. Maybe it's more difficult for people to enter that market. Or as I say, maybe you need to be deliberately, strategically conservative. So you'll have a moderate stake there because you want to invest as little as possible so that you can harvest the profitability from these brands. Um, you'll have a lower risk, and in terms of the lower risk, you should expect a lower return. And I've characterized this as an orangutan. So an orangutan is a crowd pleaser. Everyone likes an orangutan. It's not as swift moving. It's not quite as scary as a gorilla. Um, so it's a, it's a sort of a more popular, um, but uh, it's the joke that everyone finds funny, just they don't quite laugh out loud. Um, the idea is that if we put these characterizations as three different definitions of value, broad definitions of value, then my, um, my conceit is that we should use those before we decide how we're going to judge what investments we, to, we, we need to make. 
We need to design the ways of paying according to the different business needs of these. And we need to design the ways of working according to these different business needs. There are certain research protocols, for example, that kill gorillas routinely. And yet, if that's what a client's asking us to do, and an agency says, yes, we'll do that, and then we go through, and we, you know, we all know about the death by a thousand cuts, that's harming the value, not only for the agency, but, but for, the, for the client and for its return on investment. So today, um, I'm only going to talk a little bit about the procurement and the agency bit and give you an overview of what How to Buy a Gorilla does when approaching that. Um, what I want to show you first is um, this is a, a model that has um, been adapted from one that was invented by a guy called Peter Kraljic, who's a procurement um, guru from the 60s, I believe whereby on the left-hand axis you have a variability of return. He had market saturation, but a variability of return means that at the bottom you know exactly what you're getting, and at the top you don't know what it's going to be, but you know what it is that you need. And across the, the bottom is the buying power relative to the supplier. So at this end you're not an important customer, at the far end you're a very important customer. Um, but the strategies that he had for buying are consistent with this as they were for a market saturation model whereby if you know what it is that you want, there's low variability, um, so you, you, you can be assured of what it is that you're buying, and you have little buying power, then you agree standardised pricing, you automate the process. We don't get to the checkout in Sainsbury's and haggle over a tin of beans. Um, if there is a high variability of return and you don't have a great deal of buying power, this is essentially a, uh, a seller's market. Wouldn't that be nice? Um, the, the role for the buyer in a seller's market is to the nurture the, the relationship, secure the talent that they need, and incentivize them to perform. Um, on the right-hand side, if you are a, um, a, a big buyer um, with high variable outcome, then your job there, according to um, Kraljic's strategy, is to develop a long-term relationship, interesting point number one, um, and manage performance. Um, this is where I believe most um, marketing services organisations ought to be. But their experience is generally in the leverage area, whereby you're meant to use quality measures and then exploit your buying power, which for procurement means put on your crash helmet, pick up your baseball bat, go and see your agency. Everyone that I've spoken to in finance or in senior management of all agencies experience the buying process down here. Occasionally, you'll get something like behavioural science as a new thing, you'll get augmented reality as a new thing, and then quickly, as more and more agencies develop competencies or divisions or companies that can do that, they migrate with everything else down here. But the problem is that you can't... The, 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 the most important criteria for being able to buy in this manner for clients is that you can ensure the quality measures. And the primary argument we should have is that you cannot assure the quality measures of ideas in advance of commissioning the ideas. You can have competence measures. You can say, this is an ad that's OK or that's performed all right and I've got research that will back that up. But they won't ever know what the quality measures would be of the ad that they didn't buy because they didn't invest properly. So all of these ought to be here. Um, there are a couple of anomalies. One is um, downstream production. Is, it's not upstream production. Upstream production is an investment. Um, downstream production, duplication, distribution, um, that's going more towards automation. And media, I think, is a particularly interesting area because media planning is a problem with unlimited possible solutions. You can plan and buy you know, whatever kind of channel plan you want. Mm -hmm. Media buying is essentially outsourced procurement. Um, and therefore, because you can use specific quality measures, you should be able to buy, and, in, and indeed media agencies do buy, um, with a leveraged buying strategy. If we consider just the right-hand side of the um, chart, the difference between these things is that strategic buying is the, the determination, the employment of talent, whereas um, leveraged buying is the determination of skill. The difference being that I can learn how to do artwork on my laptop and then uh, I'll be rubbish at it and then I'll get better at it and then someone will be able to say whether or not I've completed that artwork correctly. It has a, uh, a, a limited amount of value in that respect. Um, but if I can write a great copy line that will convince a half a million people to buy a different car, then that's, that, that requires talent. 
So talent is more about originality, whereas um, leverage buys are more about commodity. Problems with finite solutions are things that you can buy in a leveraged manner. Problems with infinite solutions, you can't, because problems with finite solutions have limited measurable value. So if I get the right ad in the right paper on the right day with the right copy, with no typos and the right colours, I can't add more value than that. The only way I can compete on that is with price. However, if that ad is massively persuasive, I can provide unlimited potential value. Um, and unlimited potential value is the, um, the, the discussion we ought to be having with our clients when we're talking about investments. Um, so essentially, if you think about the three different monkeys that I described earlier, if you've got a, a gorilla problem, then you ought to be making that investment. You ought to be um, paying the agency in such a way as they're incentivized and they're attracted to be, to be uh, producing that kind of idea. Um, if you're a spider monkey, then you don't have that buying power. You need an agency that's going to give you lots of discretionary effort um, for their own reputation as much as for your benefit as a client. Um, and if you're an orangutan, then perhaps you want to look more at how you can limit your investment and with, with a lower expectation of return. If you think about the different ways that clients pay agencies, I wish I'd had far less builds on this. Um, <laughs> if you think about the way clients pay agencies, then all of those different nuanced differences um, actually start to line up with these different kinds of ways of paying. Media commission was a fantastic way of paying because it gave the agency responsibility for a given set of outcomes and control over how they manage their resources. Part of the problem with the way that we ceremonially sit in front of spreadsheets and talk about resource plans is that clients end up running agencies' resources and determining what agencies need in order to um, produce a, a scope of work. The, the problem that we have is, that, is the nature of investment, and we don't talk the language of investment anything like as much as we should when we're talking about clients and agencies. If you were to think of an analogy in terms of uh, drilling for oil in Texas, I need to invest a certain amount of money, a point of critical mass, in order to get any kind of return. So I might choose to drill one county in Texas and hope that I strike oil. So that's a low investment at a high risk because the likelihood of that being the right place is low. On the other hand, at the other e end of the scale, I can actually do all of Texas and all of the outlying areas. I'm going to drill everywhere, and that way I'll be certain to get it. Now, that's at a point of diminished return because it's quite likely that I'm going far too far, and therefore um, I'm limiting the amount of uh, profitability that I'm going to get from the nature of our investment. And I believe that this is much more of the language that we need to be talking about to clients with their investments. If you think about that here, um, there's a point of critical mass. You have to do something for the agency in order to, for the agency to deliver anything at all. And there's a point at which if you overpay an agency, you're not going to be improving value so significantly as it's worth it. And somewhere in between here, we're battling, um, usually with a ceremonial display of rationality over how many account executives or how many junior creative teams or whatever need to deliver a scope of work. Actually, what we should be doing is saying, how much should the client invest? How much should the agency be paid consistent with the calibre of the problem <coughs> excuse me, that they've got? If you think of, instead of prospecting for oil, we're prospecting for insights, we're prospecting for strategies, we're developing ideas, we're developing channel plans. These are problems with unlimited possible solutions. So if you divest from that as a client, then you should expect either to increase your risk or reduce your return. So if you think again about the monkeys, if you've got a gorilla, and, and if, you need, if, if that's the brand need, then you need to invest in a way that is going to be sufficiently inspiring to get the best insights, to get the best creative, so that you are going to be able to fight off other gorillas and you are going to be able to fight off spider monkeys or at least limit their damage. Um, a spider monkey would be down at this end largely because the client doesn't have that, but this is the chip shop area of advertising where the agency will, will seize these opportunities both to grow the client as a, um, as a business um, but also because it's going to enhance their own reputation with breakthrough work. And an orangutan is going to be, how do we find that balance in between the two? And that's the language that I believe that we need to talk. So instead of looking at spreadsheets, I think we need to be asking how much budget is there, what actually needs to be done, 
um, how much does the agency want and what are the category influences that should inform how much a, a client invests and then say we need to decide somewhere in that territory there is a number and, and the money is the money and we have to decide how much as a client we want to invest and the agency's job is to influence that according to the business problem not according to what the agency thinks it needs because you can't get out of that Mexican standoff by saying we need this. You can get out of that Mexican standoff by saying you need this because this is the nature of the problem that you've got. So in summary, the problem that we have is that clients commonly use orangutan processes and orangutan remuneration, but they want guerrilla ideas. Um, we need to go back to the business problem. We need to go back to the nature of the market they're in, their competitive set and the role for creativity and anchor everything that we're talking about in the client need rather than um, the agencies necessarily. If we're to establish greater trust, we have to have that shared interest and that needs a variable definition of value. So we have to change the conversation from cost to investment and according to the business problem and the nature of the risk and reward that you get depending upon the different kinds of uh, problem that they've got. So the way forward that I propose is that we challenge procurement's interest and incentives. Um, the story that I told you about ISBAR is real and prevalent and, and it can't be that somebody in the room is, um, is incentivized to reduce an investment. Anyone can reduce an investment, you just invest less. That's why marketing procurement people find it, it, it's, it's terribly easy to negotiate with agencies, but they're also not responsible for that outcome. So we must involve marketing in that conversation. We need to make that about strategic investment rather than cost management. Um, we need a common language for value and, and that shared interest. Um, we need a common set of principles for everyone to use. So the idea of how to buy a gorilla is that not only in terms of how you pay an agency, but also how you work with an agency um, is consistent with the achievement uh, or, or the optimal solution of that business problem. Um, and that it needs to be specific to the client's business needs. And that's all I got. Thank you very much.